Il prossimo, il prossimo uh, ospite è davvero un esperto mondiale di droni. Uh, appunto uh, il professor Raffaello D'Andrea dalla Svizzera. Viviamo in un periodo molto interessante e vi dico perché. Se torniamo a un po' di tempo fa, abbiamo avuto la prima rivoluzione industriale e questo è un esempio, un esempio del motore a vapore che per la prima volta è riuscito a sfruttare l'energia. Andiamo ai tempi moderni. Lo vedete questo? Abbiamo un piccolo motore elettrico che può produrre 200 watt. Se rapportiamo questo motore all'alto, vediamo una densità di potenza che è molto maggiore. Quattro di questi possono produrre un cavallo di potenza. Se volete produrre la stessa potenza di questa che abbiamo bisogno di circa 200 kg di motore a vapore. Torniamo a 70 anni fa. Questo è il matematico del tempo di oggi in cui le persone stavano in un magazzino facendo dei calcoli matematici. Andiamo ad oggi. Cosa avete voi in borsa, in tasca, il vostro cellulare? C'è un piccolo computer nel vostro cellulare che può fare più calcoli del telefono cellulare che riesce a fare più calcoli di tutti gli uomini messi insieme al mondo. Ok, questo è il piccolo device che è in tutti gli uomini messi insieme al mondo. We've been building flying machines for about 15 years. The one that you see in the picture, about 15 years old, is roughly this big. In fact, you get a sense of how big it is. I'm holding a little flying machine in my hand, and it's the exact same flying machine that's on top of the propeller in the bottom right corner. Why was that machine so big? It's because of this. This was the inertial sensor that we had to use in the center of the machine. You can see it there, that gold box. This is what was required in order to fly it. Now, that same sensor, this same sensor, is in your mobile phone. Accelerometers, ray gyros, you name it. There are many, many sensors that you can find in your mobile phone that just were not available for low cost, low size, low power, etc. That's why, instead of that big flying machine, we can build this little flying machine for hundreds of the cost. So where are we today? We have Adesso pertanto abbiamo dei sensori molto costosi, infatti abbiamo una rivoluzione di sensori che abbiamo un enorme potere di calcolo, 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 abbiamo huge amounts of computation and algorithms, and we can command the physical world to do what we want it to do. Let me give you some examples of my personal history, my personal journey through this revolution of feedback control. So what you see here are some videos of robots playing soccer. This is uh, something that I participated in from 1999 to 2005 where I led the Cornell robot soccer team when I was a professor there. These robots are fully autonomous. They're not being controlled by joystick. They're not being controlled with a mouse. They're made, the system is making decisions on its own. And you can see that they are able to do some amazing things. This is a collaboration with artists Max Dean and Matt Donovan called The Robotic Chair. This is what The Robotic Chair does. It falls apart and it puts itself back together again. And it does this over and over and over again. There are six of these robotic chairs that exist. 
It's a limited edition of six. Uh, two have been sold, one to the National Gallery of Canada and the other one to a private collector in London, England. And again, there's no human being controlling this chair. It's doing this completely on its own. So you may ask yourself, that's great, you can build robots that play soccer, you can build chairs that fall apart. Why? Well, my personal reason is that I like to create things that have never been done before. I think it's a great way to do research. It's a great way to push the boundary of what autonomous systems can do. It's a great way to educate people, including myself and my students. It's a great way to demonstrate to people that technology can be used for things that don't necessarily have a utilitarian purpose. Now, I'm not, I'm not excluding utility. I think that's perfectly fine, and this is, is an example of what can come out of it. This is a little video clip of uh, Kiva System, this company that I uh, co-founded with Mick Nouns and Peter Warman, where thousands of mobile robots are used in distribution facilities to move inventory around. Uh, and it was uh, bought last year by Amazon, and the company was uh, over 300 people. So this made me think, going through this experience, that you know, maybe I want to set up an environment at a university where we can really explore things for the sake of exploring them without having a specific purpose in mind, but to really push the boundary of what autonomous systems can do. So in 2007, uh, late 2007, 2008, I moved to Zurich at the uh, Etihad Zurich, one of the uh, best technical schools in the world, and I set up to form a research group where we could do exactly that. And I'm going to show you some clips here of some of the projects that we've developed uh, really to do with flying machines and flying planes. There's many other projects that we do, but this is specifically flying. So the flying machine arena, we use this as a test bed to see what flying things can do. They can do things like balance poles. They can throw poles and have other ones catch them. They can play ball with each other. They can do flips. They can do slalom, and they can improve their performance by doing it over and over again. So we use this as a test bed for adaptation and learning. They can work together to do things like propel balls in the air and then catch them. They can do dance performances, so they can coordinate and, uh, their actions. Another project involves flying things is the distributed flight array. In this project, we have a whole bunch of modules that can drive around, dock with peers, coordinate their actions, and once they're together, they can take flight in any different configuration that they may find themselves in. Each on its own cannot fly, but if you have at least four of them, they can fly. Here you see ecco, completely different configurations. And they can break apart e and the whole process cadere, can repeat itself. E poi il può For this last project ah, I want to talk to you about, progetto. it's uh, really out there involving flight and it has to do with wingsuit flight. In case some of you don't know what wingsuit flight is, here's a short clip. Uh, that gives you a feeling. Che this is uh, di cosa si tratta? Sw in Switzerland. Questo è Svizzera. Uno, due, tre. Ah, è un vestito volante. The smoke that you see there is just screamers. It's just there so you can visualize the flight. And near the end of the flight, the full parachute and you land. And with Gio, Jeffrey Robson, who was the person that you saw during the flight, and uh, we started doing research in the aerodynamics and the control of wingsuit flying. And in the process, we discovered that we could model wingsuit flying by putting sensors on Gio and, and uh, having them fly and record data. We discovered that we could build very good models that would predict flight. And not only that, that if the models were co are correct and it appears that they are, corretti, that they would allow corretti, us to do something which has never been done before, which is control flight with thrusters. Volo, um, and instead of me telling you exactly what the, eh, what the goal is, eh, let, me, let me have Gio tell you Bi himself. Dire la cosa da Gio. Ciao. 
So that's, that's e allora kind of uh, um, mi è piaciuto <laughs> questa è la tipica cosa che vi piace it's fare giusto? A magical and life è qualcosa assolutamente di magico cliff, che cambia la vostra like esperienza uno si butta da una roccia e via vola uh, until you have to open your parachute, ovviamente bisogna aprire il paracadute um, alla fine and you're looking at the luckiest man in the world allora, because I've managed to combine this recreational interest in wingsuit flying a, uh, with my professional and academic background la in mia vita professionale di tecnico di ingegnere con la mia passione del volo il nostro piano il nostro progetto è quello di creare un uso all'interno del computer all'interno praticamente cercando di stabilizzare il volo con un sistema di controllo in modo tale che il volo è più sicuro e più efficiente e questo apre un mondo di opportunità invece di andare praticamente giù a picchiata uno può volare in maniera orizzontale So, about a century ago, allora, the Wright brothers started human flight. It's ironic that it's taken another hundred years for us to start to look at the type of flight that I meant, the type of bird-like flight that I meant, as we were dreaming of flying with the birds. So, yeah, that's my research. I'm Questa a very lucky man. I'm a person who's very fortunate. So this is, this is the basic e questa è l'idea di base, cioè creare dei sensori per misurare delle cose durante il volo, per esempio le parti del mare, la posizione del corpo, per poter volare, uh, volare um, magari come gli uccelli, addirittura partendo e arrivando senza paracadute. In South Africa, while on holidays, while wingsuit flying, not during his research, but while on holidays with his friends, trying trying to open a new jump that had never been done before. The, uh, so, you know, he was that dedicated to, to what he believed in, that, that he actually died doing it, but he died doing something that, that made him happy, so it's, it's, not a, it's not a bad way to go. Um, the point being here is that You know, as I said, we're in very exciting times. We can sense everything about the world. We can bring huge amounts of computation to bear. And we can actuate. We can close the loop. We can create machines that have never been created before. We can make them do things that have never been done before that we can't even imagine right now what they will be able to do. So in conclude, I would say that even the sky is not the limit. Thank you.